question for the candidates, but there's a gold Mazda part <laughs> blocking the bookmobile. Does anybody in the room have a gold Mazda? <laughs> Does it have lots of bumper stickers on it? Yes. Sorry, <laughs> 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 Hi, uh, Amy Bremer, again. Uh, I'm referencing an interview that uh, Mr. Graham and Mr. Schaefer had in the Inside Columbia Magazine regarding the right to work, and since Mr. Dwyer did not get to participate in that, um, I worked for three manufacturing firms in Missouri, uh, General Motors, which has been in the news recently, and so I have a lot of experience with unions and that sort of thing, and uh, watching people sleep on the job because it was basically too difficult to get them through the agreement system to not do that. So um, I know Missouri was recently ranked number one for manufacturing, and I'm just not really sure why that is, and would like your opinion on that uh, based on the slant that, uh, again, someone who's worked in that area and knows that. and any of you have experience with the unions right Mr. Schaefer? Yeah, and I do, I support right to work. Because again, I think we're not just competing with China and India for jobs. We're competing with Tennessee and Kentucky and Indiana. That's mainly where we're losing jobs too. Because a lot of those states have better work environments. And when we're asking people in this state, put your capital back here in this community. Invest in this plant. What they need to know that what they're going to be obligated to do is reasonable and that they can sell their products at a reasonable price. But on the other side of that, there are people in this state who want to work. And I simply don't think that people should be held hostage. People who want to get out there and work and support their families be held hostage to pay a union or not work. Now, in some contexts, especially in law enforcement, I do not oppose collective bargaining. I don't, it, for the public sector, I do not support, for example, the right to strike. But I do think that when you're dealing with some entities, it is more efficient to have some collective bargaining. But I simply don't think that, that employees and workers should be held hostage by unions before they can go out and get a job. Mr. Grant? I support the right of workers to organize. Uh, that's why we have a five-day work week. And that's why we have weekends. That's why we have a lot of guarantees for the working people of this country. Uh, if we did not have the right to organize, both publicly and privately, imagine what the world looks like. CEOs already make enough money. We had one CEO who worked 13 days on Wall Street before the collapse who got paid $16 million to walk away. That doesn't happen to a line worker in a GM plant. It just doesn't. White collar workers are unionizing more than blue collar. Well, and they have, they have absolutely the right to. And you know, I'm not going to uh, ever vote to restrict the right of individuals to collectively get together as a workforce and work together for a better work environment, work together for better wages, work together for better health care, because I think that those things are important to the average working people. I think it's fair for a working person to make a decent salary and a living wage. I don't think that CEOs on Wall Street and CEOs of all these companies who have golden parachutes, can't remember the number of houses that they own, should be the only ones that are making money when we're producing the things that we're producing in this country. And, and the question was whether uh, people should be allowed to form a union, collective well, and, bargaining. And based on, do you have any experience with that directly to make such statements? Uh, the only, uh, when, my, when I was growing up, uh, before my dad uh, lost his job, he was a union truck driver. Um, and an interesting story uh, he liked to tell was he was at a job site once and was, uh, he, he called back and said, I can't do this. You're, uh, so the company told him, well, you're fired, jump in your truck, bring it back, bring it back to the, to the shop. The, the interesting part about that, two, two aspects. The, the one inter interesting part of that is um, when they fired him, as soon as they told him to get into his truck because he was union, they basically rehired him. Um, so, so the good part about that is, yeah, he, he didn't lose his job. The bad part is... An employee, an employer can fire you for for no reason, um, and I would have a, um, somewhat of a problem with uh, an employer being or an employer being on fire, an employee for for no reason. Thank you. Come out and say your name and ask your question. My name is Sean Randall. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Missouri back in May. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting such a forum, but I'd also like to thank them for um, just over four years ago in 
I raise this? Oh, boy. Um, just over four years ago, um, on the ballot here in Columbia in 2004, there was propositions one and two. One for the decriminalization of marijuana in the city, and one for medical marijuana. The legal women voters in 2004 did support the medical marijuana bill. Along with them, there has also been the American College of Physicians, the American Multiple Sclerosis Society, the American Cancer Society, Mary Nurses. You can get to your question. Absolutely. I would just like to say, with that support and the fact that 69% of Columbia voters supported that proposition in 2004, would you be in favor of sponsoring, co-sponsoring, or supporting slash voting for that bill? Mr. Graham, sir. Uh, thank you for that uh, question. I think it's the second time you probably asked me that. <laughs> and uh, that's great. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, first of all, let me. Correct one thing, uh, we didn't vote to decriminalize marijuana on that ballot. What we did was we changed the court that that was going to be in. It's a city ordinance violation now. Right, because I, I can tell you I had a whole lot of Republicans that wanted to cut money from Columbia in every way, shape, and form because they thought that we decriminalized that and they were very, very angry with me um, uh, about that. And so um, uh, let's, I just want to be very careful about what that did because it didn't decriminalize it. Um, second of all, uh, I would not support that, and I understand uh, the reasons that you bring forth because I've, I've listened to you before, um, you know, and in my own family, uh, you know, I have a disability. My brother is a quadriplegic. Um, my two parents both died of small cell lung cancer, so I understand the patient advocacy groups and what they bring to that. Um, I also think, though, that there's a counterbalance to that, and one of the things I've been bothered by, to be really honest with you. Uh, is within the community that is pushing this is if you get outside of a public forum they will admit that this is all about decriminalization and we just are using this as a gateway to open that legally. Um, if you're for medicinal marijuana that's fine be honest about it, but if all we're doing is trying to open a door to be able to decriminalize that's a problem and I don't like patient groups being utilized in that way. Dwyer. Thank you. Um, my answer would be to three questions. Uh, I believe would be no, no, and no. Uh, to make it short and simple, I, I, I prefer to be pretty direct. I don't have, I don't necessarily have a problem with uh, the medical use of marijuana, but as Chuck said, you wonder if it's going to be uh, a step in the direction of, of legalizing it. But even if you were able to help one patient who's suffering with a life-threatening illness, and the fact that there are going to be people who might abuse the system, there's people who abuse every you know political you know policy that we have out there right now. And I don't think that by you know saying we might have this problem with decriminalization or it's just a great way to that that we, we should disallow. We do appreciate your question, but we do have to keep with a time limit. Sorry, I believe it's Mr. Schaefer's turn. Out Dwyer, you're finished. Okay. At this point, no, but I'll tell you, you know, my dad was a general surgeon, he was chief of surgery at, at, at a hospital, and he also ran the cancer center for a while at that hospital. He was involved in national clinical studies on breast uh, cancer and was a, a national leader in that. And I will tell you that as a, as a lawyer, I deal with doctors, I deal with experts in various fields all the time. And one thing I learned as a lawyer, it's not my role to say that I'm the expert. It's my role to understand the science and to understand the issues and to be able to articulate that to other people. I don't think that there's general acceptance in the medical community right now for that. But if there was general acceptance in the medical community for that as a valid medical therapy, that's something that I'd be willing to discuss. I don't think it's there now, so no, I don't support it right now. Do we have any more audience questions at this time? Looks like someone's coming up. As a believer in the free market, I was a bit uh, concerned when the state legislature um, mandated ethanol, uh, I believe it was two sessions ago, or I'm sorry, last session, that you have the mandatory 10% blending. I'm curious to hear the, the different candidates' um, reasoning on, on their favor or opposition to that measure. Thanks. Could you state your name one oh. more time? I know you've asked sorry. previously, but. John Schultz. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Dwyer, you start this time. Um, as a farmer, I, I believe I can at least speak to this issue. I'm not a big fan of the mandated ethanol. I don't have a problem with ethanol. Uh, but as a, as a mandated, I, I think the free market should, we should allow the free market to work if it's a great product. And it's, it, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be accepted by us as individuals. Me personally, as far as corn to ethanol, as I like to say, I'd rather be feeding the corn to my pigs and my cattle as opposed to feeding my truck with, with ethanol. Um, so I don't think it should be a, a mandated, I don't have a problem with with it, uh, with ethanol, just a mandate. Thank you. Mr. Graham? 
Or, sorry, Mr. Schaefer, I apologize. Thanks. You know, I'm mostly an environmental and an energy lawyer. That's what I do. About 60% at least of my law practice is energy and environment law. And I generally am a free market person as well, but I do think there, there comes a time when in, in, in public policy you have to say we have to break some of these trends and we've got to find some alternatives. I think that ethanol, I think getting the markets in place, um, getting the infrastructure in place, I think is a worthwhile thing. I think the mandate should have a sunset on it. I think the Department of Conservation's uh, one-eighth of one cent sales tax should have a sunset on it. I don't think any tax should exist that doesn't at least have some periodic review. But I think on ethanol, you know, I support it initially to try and promote that market. I think when we, if we can switch over to switchgrass and get, I mean, it's always controversial when you're making energy from food. But if we can get that biomass from switchgrass and other sources and we have those infrastructures in place to deliver that product, which is an alternative energy source, I do support that. But I think we've got to reevaluate that maybe five to seven years and say, is this still worth the mandate? Is it still worth the funding? And if it's not at that point, then we have to stop it. Mr. Green. Uh, thank you. First of all, John, thank you for the question. It's good to finally put a face with the name and the letters I've seen in letters to the editor. <laughs> I'm assuming you're the same John Schultz, so uh, that's great. Uh, I voted for the 10% uh, uh, ethanol mandate. Uh, I think that we have to do what we can at this time to try uh, to reduce um, our incredible independence on foreign oil, and uh, we needed to create enough of a marketplace that it was going to be a viable product. And so uh, I did support that, and I support that at this time, and I agree with Kurt that you know we need to take a look at moving to switchgrass and other biofuels. Uh, but I also think that biofuels really are, are kind of a bridge measure uh, that we need to work on. We really need to invest in research and technologies in higher education to try to move to a completely different energy source and get completely away from oil because I think it's a matter of not just our economic security but our national security to be able to move away from that as an energy source and I hope that uh, we take that on like an Apollo challenge over the next several years. My name is Nancy Harder and um, we heard a lot about Mohila. I'm not sure where it stands now legally. Can each of you tell us what the mission or mandate of Mohila is? Mr. Schaefer? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Ed pointed this out previously. Everybody needs to understand that loans are not initiated with Mohila. It's a consolidator. It was a middleman created not just by Missouri, but, you know, I know you're from Vermont. And, um, and Washington. In Washington, right. And I was lost from Vermont, and I used BSAC, which is Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, which is Vermont's state consolidator. Those things were created by the General Assembly at a time when it was hard to get private banks to give loans to people. And so what it did was it provided a mechanism, a middleman, so that you could have privately initiated loans and you had middle, the middleman who would then buy them, bundle them, and sell them on the auction rate market. Well, that market fell out because of the subprime mortgage uh, crisis. And the thing is, we're actually lucky that Mohila sold those assets when they did, because if they didn't, they would simply be sitting on a lot of bundled worthless loans. You know, but again, there's always a question of do you need that and, and how much do you need that middleman in that process? I think that things like you know buying an 11 to 15 million dollar building, which, which the executives did, I think was a horrible waste of money. I don't think the condition that we're in right now has anything to do with the Mohila sale. I think that we should have taken, and I want to say this right now, I oppose any restrictions on stem cell research, but I think we should have done a better job of getting that 85 million dollars because in that 250 million dollar first payment, that Mohila made to the state, we were number one on that project, and we would have that money right now. Mr. Green? Well, uh, Kurt's inaccurate on that. Um, that wasn't going to happen unless we took restrictions. But back to your question on Mohila. The big problem was that the governor, through that legislation in the legislature, uh, forced them to also um, get rid of all the CAS assets and hand that over to the state. That's part of why they can't survive this. And they were warned ahead of time by that. The Liskarnan report said that there were looming credit uh, crunches that were going to come and that it would be imprudent for them to do that. Um, no one in the governor's office paid attention to that because they were invested in get, getting rid of the not-for-profit lender. Remember, the original idea was to sell off the entire uh, Mohila. Uh, they were wanting to liquidate it. They're a not-for-profit driver in the student loan market that helps keep down loan rates. There are now some students paying as high as 13% out of the Mohila loans. And for the third quarter in a row, Mohila has not been able to make their payment to the state for their end of this bargain. I'm not sure they ever will be able to do that because of the devastating impact of the way that that was structured. Mr. Dorn. Thank you. Um, 
to tell you the truth, I don't know enough about this issue to speak to it, so I'm not going to speak at all. Thank you, though. Can I take his time? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, as it seems we have a lull, um, I actually have a pre-prepared question. Uh, the Insure Missouri plan to accommodate the health care needs of the low-income, uninsured worker came before the legislature last session but did not pass. If elected, what health care proposal would you support to help resolve the needs of low-income, uninsured workers? And Mr. Graham will be getting this time. Thank you. Uh, the, the first thing I think that we need to do, and something that we passed and I co-sponsored in the Missouri Senate, we passed it unanimously, was to deal with the issue of Medicaid fraud. There's half a billion dollars of Medicaid fraud. For the people who say that there's no money to be able to restore these cuts, if we eliminated just half of the Medicaid fraud that's in the state, mostly provider fraud, we would be able to recapture all that federal money and provide more than a billion dollars worth of health care to people. That got over the House, and the Speaker refused to even read the bill in. We've got to get serious about people that are stealing from our state treasury through Medicaid fraud and get that back into health care programs, especially for the 50,000 children that lost their coverage and for the people with disabilities who had these severe draconian cuts for the single mother of two kids who can't make more than $2,100 a year and keep her own health care from the cuts that were implemented. And we can do that by beginning to recoup that money from Medicaid fraud and that should be the first bill that we put on the governor's desk in January. Mr. Dwight? Thank you. Um, sorry, once again, not an issue that I can speak to. I will say that both sides, both on this issue and the Mohila, uh, will muddy the waters so you're not really going to get a clear um, a idea of what's going on until you get down to Jeff City and actually get in and, and talk to the both sides and try and figure it out. I'll just say that both sides are going to uh, muddy the issue and try and blame one or the other on the issue. Thank you. Mr. Chief. Well, I'll pick up right on that point. Senator Graham has been in Jefferson City for 12 years. Why did this <coughs> ever get to the point where it got so drastic on either side? Who was asleep at the switch and not watching where that money was going for all of that time? We had almost one in five Missourians on Medicaid. We were the fourth or fifth, we had the fourth or fifth largest number per capita, per dollar, of any state on what we were spending on Medicaid. How on earth did we get to that? That's what we can't go back to. But let me... I think the issue there is, and again, I, I tell people this, what, what the Democrats don't want to tell you is since 2005, the rolls have gone up 20%. And they've gone up 20% because eligibility criteria has been reestablished to make sure that those people that really need the services are on it. And we need to reevaluate that because anybody who truly needs those services should be on it. But one in five Missourians, that's not acceptable and we cannot return to that. Do you have any audience questions at this time? Can we have another one? And this is a, kind of in the same vein as the previous. Um, Mr. Dwyer will start this time. What impact will the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, recently signed by the President, have on health care in Missouri? Sorry, I, I, I really can't. I really don't know. I'm sorry. Mr. Schaefer? Well, I, I think the issue is, it's, a, it, it's I mean, when you're dealing with health care on a national level, you, you've got to have a federal requirement for parity. I support parity. Uh, I think that there's no difference. I mean, a mental illness is a physical illness. And we were all, it, it, it's a mental health forum, and I think a lot of us were in agreement on that. Um, I think we need to look at that issue uh, for the state. I will tell you, I think there are a lot of things in the area of health insurance that we need to reevaluate. I, I, and I'll tell you one of the biggest issues, I think, in health care, we need to reevaluate. We, we passed tort reform. We're not seeing the frivolous lawsuits that we used to see. Those suits that we see now have kind of a gatekeeping control now where we see the cases where people really do have medical issues. But we haven't done the second step, which, for example, the state of Indiana has done, and that is reevaluate um, the insurance, uh, the medical, mal or medical uh, malpractice insurance for doctors. I think we need to reevaluate re that. I think we can do things like that more in a state than we can on the parity issue because I think it's more of a federal issue. But I do think that we need to evaluate that. Mr. Graham. Thank you. Um, 
I'm not sure of the impact of the federal statute, but hopefully uh, it will be something that is productive. Obviously, uh, in the area of health care, uh, the free market uh, left alone to itself has not worked. There are health insurance companies that won't provide uh, health insurance to people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, for many people, especially in small business, they can't afford to buy health insurance on the open market. For somebody with a pre-existing condition, they almost have to work for a corporation that employs more than 50 people or for the government because it's the only way that they can get any sort of health insurance coverage. But we do need to invest in mental health in this state. And one of the first things we gotta do is help make sure that we keep uh, MIDMO open. Uh, it's a critical uh, component. And as somebody who unfortunately had to have my brother placed there last year, when there are no other options, that is a tremendous asset for this community. And it's also very important for law enforcement um, because there are so many people there right now, uh, and, and we don't have uh, the community uh, mental health that used to be provided. Many of the sheriffs are now just bringing people there because they don't have anywhere in their community to get treatment. So we have to expand community treatment options in addition to what happens with this new federal law. Come on, state your question. State your name first, please. Linda Kaiser. Uh, Missouri adopted a number of years ago a nonpartisan approach to the selection of judges an approach that was adopted by some 35 other states. Last year, within this last year, Governor Blunt has proposed eliminating that and going to the strictly partisan selection process that we've seen in Washington, D.C. for a number of years. I'm curious about what your views are on that and how you would vote on that question. Mr. Schaefer, you will start this question. Thanks. I, I don't think actually that's the plan that the governor supported, but he did support a change. But I'll tell you, I mean, as somebody who has litigated I don't even know how many cases. I've had over 90 cases alone in the Missouri Court of Appeals and the Missouri Supreme Court. And I've had, I've, I've tried case in, cases in front of trial judges all over the state. Nothing is more critical than having qualified judges at all levels of our courts. I, you know, I generally do not support a wholesale change to the plan. I think there needs to be more accountability. I think it needs to be more open. I also, and most, people, most of you who know, there are actually there are three lay people, three people selected by the Missouri Bar, and then this, the uh, Chief Justice of the Missouri Supreme Court. I will tell you that I think the Missouri Bar has done a very bad job of monitoring who gets on that panel. And I think that you have a lot of, because you've got the plaintiff's bar and you've got the defense bar. And the representation on that on the judicial selection committee that comes out of the Missouri Bar should be a mix of both. And that process has really been hijacked by plaintiff's lawyers, and I think the bar has done a bad job with that. I don't think that we need to wholesale redo the system, but I think that we need to be careful who those bar members are, make sure that there's a, a wide range of views, and make sure that the selection process is done more in the open than it's done right now. I oppose uh, Governor Blunt's plan uh, to undo uh, the Missouri uh, nonpartisan court plan. There's a reason that other states have modeled this. And this was created after all the corruption with the Pendergrass machine uh, back in the 1940s. This has worked remarkably well for the people of this state. And as he tried to do that, I'm the recognizing Democrat on the Judiciary Committee. We blocked that in committee uh, every time that that came up uh, because we don't want to see the selection of our judges become hyper-partisan. If you take a look at what happens in Washington, you see these partisan ideological battles in the Senate. Um, we do set a confirmation for a number of positions in state government, and a senator has to sponsor people to be able to get that. I serve on uh, that committee. Uh, I would not want to see uh, that hyperpartisanship brought before the gubernatorial appointments committee by having all the judges throughout the state have to go through that process, uh, because I think that it should stay as nonpartisan as possible, and the Missouri plan is a good plan. It's worked very well for the people of the state. Mr. Joy. Um, I would both agree with uh, Chuck Graham and Kurt. Uh, um, I think it should be left alone. However, I think it should be more of an open, so so the public actually knows what's going on. And um, that's that's where I stand. If I if it came before me to change, I believe the only thing like that I would change is I'd make it more of an open process as opposed to being behind closed doors. Uh, yes, my name is Manasseh McPike. Uh, my father was a psychiatrist for 20 years, and, and of course my question has to do with uh, mental health, but also largely health care in general. If legislation were to come up to start you know, lessening the involvement of health insurance companies uh, in the uh, medical field, 
Would you be willing to uh, sponsor such a bill so that, that way doctors can actually do their jobs without always having to uh, worry about looking over their back because, or look over their shoulder because an insurance company is going to jump down their throat because they didn't run such 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 test or whatever. And we're starting with Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you, thank you for that question. I think that's a, a part of the whole problem that we have in, in the healthcare system now is that we don't have doctors making a lot of those decisions. It's a bean counter uh, with a different degree, maybe not even that same specialty uh, at some health insurance company. And it's become such a bloated system where in the United States of America, we spend 16% of our GDP uh, on health care. Um, and we have, at the same time, almost 50 million people without any health insurance who end up over at the university ER for primary care that costs the taxpayers more. That's why it's 16% of our GDP. Whereas the nations that we compete with around the world, it's 11% of their GDP and everybody has some coverage. I think we should have a basic level of coverage for everybody in this country so that we are providing primary care in less expensive settings directly with physicians. Uh, and I think we need to give physicians and patients more control over their health care and not just being counters at insurance companies. And I'd be very interested in working on legislation. Mr. Dwyer? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, I, I would agree that um, health care and health care providers um, are tied down by the insurance companies and um, I, I really don't know where to go with that subject other than they're being they're being their backs are tied I, I, I know that being a in a uh, HMO uh, we, we basically have a, a where we can go and who we can see and if we go out of there then then we pay full price so you're, you're kind of left with a, a small number of doctors that this health health care or HMO will, will let you go I think I think that needs to end. I also would like to see that we could move and um, be more competitive as, as far as um, right now we're limited to just in state. If you're in the federal government, you can get insurance in any state, any any provider. And I think uh, us in Missouri, I think we should uh, be able to uh, break out of the state of Missouri and go seek um, health coverage through other providers outside the state. I, thanks. I, I do agree that possibly looking at larger pools to bring down insurance costs is a good idea, but I will tell you that I adamantly believe that medical decisions should be made by medical providers, not insurance companies or politicians. So I'll do everything I can to make sure that it always stays that way and that we can bring down costs and keep it that way. My name is Nancy Copenhaver. Um, I'm a retired teacher and I'm also very concerned about education. We know that the number one priority in our state in the Constitution is the education of our, of our children. We are not currently funding it at the level that it needs to be done and I would like to know your position on vouchers, tuition tax credits, or any other measures like that that take away public money from public schools. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer, we start. Thank you. Um, I think we need to give our children uh, and families uh, a bigger choice, just like in the uh, medical field. I am for vouchers. I am for, um, I, I would hate to say I'm for tax credits because I'd really like to do away with the, uh, the income tax here in the state of Missouri and move to a uh, what's known as a consumption tax or fair tax. So that would actually do away with your um, tax credits. Tax credits are, are, are well, I won't speak to that issue, but um, basically, I am for vouchers, and I think we should punish our children by making them go to a school just because their parents live in a, are, can only afford to live in a certain school district. Um, we should allow them to move to better schools uh, and make the schools more accountable and uh, more competitive. And I think that will that that will um, solve your your school problems. Schaefer? My wife and I are very active with the Columbia Public School uh, system with our kids' school. We've been involved in issues with the school board. Um, as far as funding, um, you know, I'd like to see the funding formula funded a little faster than it is, but that money's got to come from somewhere, and that's the big issue. We just don't have it right now. The issue on, on vouchers, you know, we have a luxury here because the things that we quibble about, about our public school system, are pretty minor in the, in the big picture. But when you go to St. Louis or you go to Kansas City and you look at a, 
you know, at a 10-year-old girl, a 15-year-old boy, and you look at their parents and you say, you are being held in a failing school system, but sorry, there's nothing we can do about it, you just got to accept your lot in life. I think that is absolutely unacceptable. I think that there should be some threshold that when a school simply has proven over and over that it cannot deliver for parents and for children, there has to be some mechanism to let those families have some form of choice to get out of that rut. And if that's tax, uh, you know, I would leave nothing off the table in evaluating that problem. And whether that's tax credits or whether that's vouchers, I would analyze all those if I didn't to see what would fit in the situation. Mr. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, I, I guess Kurt saying does support them. I, I don't know exactly what that position was, but I'll be very clear about my Nancy. Uh, I'm opposed uh, to tuition tax credits. I am opposed to vouchers. Uh, I'm a product of the public schools, uh, as are many people that are here tonight. Uh, the public schools are the great fabric of our state, uh, and they are what allow everybody to have an opportunity to be educated in this country. You don't make the public schools better by starving them. And the question we all have to ask is, why do we have a billionaire in St. Louis that is spreading all this political money around trying to get vouchers passed? You know, is it really because of the kids that go to those failing schools, or is it just another way to get more money to John Burroughs and Chaminade and all the wealthy uh, private schools in St. Louis? I don't think that's the best way to improve public education, by taking money out of the system. You can't, you can't say you're for more money in the system and then say, but I also want a suck out on this end where people can get money and take it out of the system. It doesn't work like that. All right. We have time for one more question. Okay, why not? So I'll take a different slant on that. So we keep throwing more money in education, but it still doesn't get better. Perhaps that's not the answer. Why don't we look at what schools are spending their money on? Every student goes to school for an education, not for sports. So my proposal would be to cut sporting activities. If you want to do that, that's voluntary. What do you think about that? Or if you don't agree with that, what else would you do? You know, on that issue, there's no doubt that with schools, you know, I think arts and education are first and foremost. And I'm a, I'm a sports fan, I love sports, but I think when you're in tight budget times, you've got to look at what's appropriate for a school and what's not. And I think when you look at, you know, Senator Graham held the state of Missouri hostage for, what, $45 million for a new arena, which we get maybe, what, 10,000 people in that thing a year now. Again, that, those were decisions made that money could have gone to the university for education and the arts instead it went to a sports program. You know, I think the big issue here is we've got to look at things like merit pay, and we've got to break the effect of simply because you're employed by a school, you'll always be employed by a school. You've got to, and all of us probably have a memory from our childhood of a teacher. I know I certainly do, both in grade school and in, in, at the university. You have a memory of a teacher who really changed your life. Well, those are the type of teachers that we should be rewarding. Those are the, you know, those are the role models that we should be building up and paying them more money instead of saying, well, yeah, you get the same amount of money as the, as the next person next to you who, might, who doesn't even want to be here today. And again, I think we can look at those things to make schools better. But when a school over and over again fails families, there has to be some way out. I, I don't know how it is termed that you held someone hostage when the House, the Senate, and the Governor all agreed on a project that was very important for this district and something that I'm proud of. Secondly, on sports. First of all, I, I believe strongly in local control. This is up to local school boards. They get to decide, and they're all very different. If you go in very rural areas, they spend more on transportation than we do in Columbia because they're all spread out. So you've got to give them the creativity to do that, which is why I oppose Governor Blunt's 65% plan. The, I also think it's very important that we do have some athletics there. Childhood obesity is one of the greatest dangers that's facing this country. Newt Gingrich came in and talked to the state senate, and I agreed with him that we've got to do something about childhood obesity because that's turning into diabetes at very young ages, and that is going to be the number one future health care cost to the people of this country if we don't do something about it. So I'm not particularly in favor of getting rid of physical activities and sports because I think they're very important, but that's also a local school board decision, not something to be mandated from Jefferson City. Thank you. Uh, once again, I find myself partially agreeing with, with Kurt Schaefer and partially agreeing with uh, Chuck Graham. You know, I, I am also a product of the um, 
uh, public school school service. Um, but I, I think the schools should be uh, in control of their own destiny. And if they so choose to fund sports, and um, I don't have a problem with that, I would leave that up to the voters who would say, we don't like the people on the school board. We're going to vote those out. And, and we're going to vote in new people who, who uh, will put our focus where we believe it should be. And I believe it that. We are now ready for the candidates to make their two-minute closing comments. The candidates will speak in reverse order from their opening statements. Mr. Dwyer, you may now present your closing comments. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out um, and listen to our points of views. You may not agree with us, but at least you, you um, can hear and see where we stand. Um, I, I hope that um, you would um, look at a different um, different candidate other than your your Republican Democrat. Uh, I think, as you see, they'll on a lot of your issues that they'll bring forward. They like to muddy the issues. I'm more of a straightforward person. You come to me, I'll give you a straightforward answer. I'm not going to beat around the bush and throw numbers one way and and make them sound to go another way. Um, so I, I think um, with uh, being elected uh, as a libertarian to represent the 19th district, I, I think that I'd be able to better serve the uh, both Randolph and Boone County, um, being able to work with both the Republicans and, and Democrats and, and not having a, um, a bias basically e either way. Um, and, and as I would like to say, um, I may not be the, uh, the sharpest stick in the field, but if you follow me, I'll, I'll get the job done. Thank you. Mr. Graham, you may present your closing comments. Uh, thank you. And um, first of all, I, I want to thank Chris and Kurt for both uh, being here this evening. Um, you know, I like when we're able to come out and have these forums. And for the most part, uh, I think we've kept this on a very issue-oriented basis this evening. And I think uh, that's a credit not only to the candidates that are here, but I think it's also a credit to the league and the type of history that you have. You know, we do have choices in this election. And as I laid out at the very beginning, uh, we have been moving in the wrong direction uh, with the Republican leadership that we've had from Governor Blunt to the state legislature. Uh, this one party rule has not worked very effectively for the people of this state, and people are not very happy about that. You know, I've done my best to stand up there when bad things were happening. I was able to block some of those things. I wasn't able to block everything, but I did the best job that I could. And most importantly, uh, I think, and George Parker would understand this, I've done a very good job at being able to block uh, the mixture of church and state that has been going on in the Capitol, the effort to be able to do that. Because I believe there should be a high wall of separation between church and state. And that is something that's gotten lost in the mix down there. Uh, I look forward to getting back to working on moving this state forward. Um, I didn't like having to play defense, but you know what? When there's nobody left to be on that wall, somebody had to be on that wall, and I was on that wall for you. I hope that we begin to work back in a progressive agenda where we invest in higher education. That's where we're going to grow the jobs of the 21st century. They cluster around areas of higher education, especially if we can beef up our math and science in our public schools. This district uh, has a wealth of opportunities. From Moberly Area Community College to Stevens to Columbia College to the great University of Missouri. This is where the jobs of the 21st century are going to grow. If we invest in this institution, if we make sure kids leave here without a lot of debt, if we're able to take the great ideas they come up with through our business incubator and move those into startup companies, we're going to have the high-tech jobs of the future going right here. We need to get back to the life sciences corridor that we all talked about from Kansas City to here to St. Louis. If we get back on that track, we'll be the new research triangle of this century, and I look forward to being a part of it. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Mr. Schaefer, you may present your closing comments. Thank you. We need change in Jeff City. I'm a political moderate. One of my political heroes is John Danforth, and he was in town last week for an event for me. And he has a phrase in his, in his book, his 2000 book, Faith in Politics, which is, extremists may get elected, but moderates get things accomplished. And what we're missing now are people who can get things accomplished. And at that event, a woman, a woman asked a question of Senator Danforth. She said, you know, where have all the statesmen gone? Where are the people who know how to negotiate, who know how to speak and negotiate and persuade? Where have those people gone? Because those are the people that we need that can articulate sound public policy and persuade people to their side of what's the right thing to do. And I thought it was a great question because we don't have that. We have extremism on both sides. And that's what we've got to have change from. Because there are two big issues, well, there are a lot of issues in this community, but two big issues. 
One is the University of Missouri. And, and let's set the record straight. When Bob Holden was governor and the Democrats were in the majority in the legislature, the university went through a $100 million budget cut, its biggest budget cut ever. And we're still recovering from that. The budget has gone up almost $100 million in the last four years. But let's understand that's the case. DNR, for example, under the Democrats when they were in the General Assembly in the majority and Governor Holden, general revenue at the Department of Natural Resources went from almost $30 million to $3 million. So let's keep things in perspective about who can balance a budget and who can make hard decisions. But the university is a key issue, and I will tell you that I think our lack of representation in the Senate on the $85 million for the Health Sciences Center, the inability to negotiate to get that project, because we all know what Senator Graham did to lose that money, he filibustered. But my question to all of you is, what was done to bring that project here? And the answer to that is nothing. Any senator can filibuster, but it should always be a tool of last resort. You should never have to get there if you have the negotiation skills and the reasonableness and the persuasiveness to get people to see your side of the coin. And that's what we're missing right now. The other issue we've got is law enforcement. And I will tell you that as a former prosecutor, one thing we need in the state is truth and sentencing. So when a woman is a victim of a violent crime, and she goes into court, and, she, and the defendant gets a 20-year sentence, she needs to know that that's a 20-year sentence and not a six-year sentence or a five-year sentence before she has to be concerned about that person getting out. Again, these are issues that we can we can get to, we can pass for the betterment of all of us. We just need the professionalism and the persuasion. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. We'd like to thank all the 19 state Senate candidates. <laughs> the Columbia Public Library and the American Association.